Right. All right, in theory, I always make this joke. It's not funny. We're live. We did it. We did it. We've collapsed the wave function. Uh, anyone who is watching us today knows that we exist. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another special interview on my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm joined today by a very special guest, a PhD student, Devin Carroll, roboticist. Hey, Devin. Welcome to the channel. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. So the question I always ask people, who are you? What do you do? Okay. So I am Devin Carroll. Um, I work at the University of Pennsylvania as a um, PhD student. So I'm working towards my uh, dissertation in officially mechanical engineering, but my dissertation is focused on robotics and how do we design robots from in situ or found material. Um, so wood, ice, uh, kind of hitting the nail on the head there. Other things might be like recycling um, a milk crate or something and using that to build robots with. Yeah. Um, so I explore all of those things. So you looked at, I mean, I guess the question is like, if you're going to send a robot to some distant location, how much robot can you make from the raw materials that you have available? That's right there. Exactly. Okay. All right. And so, and so what did you determine? I guess it depends on the destination. Yes, very much so. Um, so I, I took a lot of inspiration from um, a guy named von Neumann. Von Neumann. Yeah. Um, okay. Great. Uh, right. The, so I don't. This is perfect. Then this is going to be a good conversation. All right. So all the way back in the fifties, um, John von Neumann was an amazingly smart dude, and he looked into self-replicating systems, um, and that kind of brought about von Neumann probes, which space exploration, kind of a big deal, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The challenge being, and, and people have explored this, uh, and we've gone from theory to some physical systems. The challenge with these physical systems is they're not actually self-replicating. They're all self-assembling. Right. We have to provide them with the materials. Yeah. You're, um, so by this, the way, you're, you're wiggling a lot. I don't know if you've oh, got your laptop on your lap or something. I'm... But... I'm Touching my table. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just be better. careful about that. Yeah, it jiggles the camera. Yeah, please continue. Okay, so, uh, so self assembling. You have to provide the material. Um, so being able to do that with material we find on site gets us that much closer to these self replicating robots, which is a very far off dream. Yep. But more immediately, it gives us the capability of self repair and self augmentation. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a robot and I'm traveling through a forest and my arm breaks, maybe I grab a tree branch and repair my arm, but then I can continue my mission. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, which is which is sort of a, a lot more capable than what we are. I mean, you know, the only way we can repair ourselves is to eat, let our bodies heal. But yeah, if you've got a robot that's made of wood, then it could craft mm -hmm. a new wooden part, splice it in, just keep exactly. going. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome and kind of terrified. I'm sort of imagining a science fiction horror movie where a robot just sort of picks apart its landscape to make itself more, uh, you know, more functional. So, have you ever seen Stargate SG-1? Sure, of course. Replicators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. they do exactly that. Yeah, that's right? true. Yeah, but they're kind of sort of a nanobot kind of way, but a little bit, to it yeah. at a macro level. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, so that's the core of the idea is, is how can you make a robot that can make manufacture as much of itself like in the von neumann which we'll get to in a second here but but in the sort of the von neumann sense of of building itself uh repairing itself and essentially minimizing the amount of payload that you have to send to some destination because that's the expensive part if you could just send a tiny exactly. little seed and then you grow a tree you've sent a tree um, mm -hmm. so then, okay. So then you examined some, some different ideas. What, uh, what were some of the, I guess, some of the materials that you investigated? Yeah. So we actually started with wood, um, and looking at how do we take tree branches and build structures from them? Um, and we, we showed that we could take these structures and, using some clever geometry, uh, get a really good approximation or a really good analysis for truss structures made from these really 
crazy looking tree branches. Yeah. Um, but uh, as you can imagine, working with these tree branches and making robots out of them is not easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like they're expert level woodworking. You got to bring without, a lathe. Without saws or anything of that. Any yeah. Of that. Yeah. And, th and that was kind of my goal. I was like, I didn't want to have to change these tree branches. I just wanted to use them as they were and incorporate them into the robot. But they're discrete. Um, there are a lot of constraints on what you could build. So then we started moving around. And I think one day in the lab, um, one of my lab mates was like, well, have you looked at Antarctica? Like, we make igloos and things like that all the time. And that kind of clicked. And then Mark and I, my advisor, were like, wait, robots from ice. This could be really cool, really wow. interesting. Yeah. And because it's because ice is more of a continuum or more of a continuous material, you can do so much more with it, right? Like you can change the shape so significantly and redesign it and optimize it in ways that we never before were possible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so 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 then I guess you started to consider ice mm -hmm. and, and how did you approach this problem? How do we approach this problem? Well, I just started building things. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. So, so finish your thought. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, like, like uh, on the one hand, you're exactly I'm, like, like I'm imagining some robot that's running through the forest, and it mm -hmm. it has a little a little snipper on it, and it sees a pr tree branch. It's exactly the right size. Right. Snips out the length, attaches it to its little socket, and it just keeps going. Yeah. And so you've got good tensile strength i forget sort of which strength you're looking mm -hmm. for here but you've got a good I mean, you've got a pretty good in tension and compression but not buckling right so you've got a nice uh, sort of uh structure that can that can support the weight of the robot mm -hmm. but with ice you've got like this and out in the outer solar system i can imagine or you know this rock hard yeah. substance that is that has a lot of flaws and is very hard to shape unless you can turn it into water first. So, is it though? Is it well? Okay, good so, question. Yeah, yeah. Machining actually works really well. Um, so, so if you go on YouTube and you can just search, um, I forget what you search, but like it comes up with um, they make bottles of ice to hold vodka, for example, and they're literally just machining these. So, like you'd have to bring a machining. Uh, it, factory but right like, we're back eh. to the lathe problem but sure yeah okay. yeah but like you could do that yeah um there are actually some really cool papers on 3d printing with ice where where again you have to melt it down but hey what are you going to do so one of the things we explored was actually what is the ideal manufacturing method is it molding is it 3d printing is it machining mm -hmm. and from an energy point of view if you had everything on site machining is actually the least expensive Right. You take a block of ice, obvious reasons. carve up the, 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 sh the shapes that you require and you're, and you're yeah. good to go. As opposed to, um, I guess, melting and, you know, building a form, melting down, filling mm -hmm. the form, freezing and letting it freeze again. That's pretty complicated. And the 3D printing sounds like that's like the, the minimum amount of, well, maybe not. I mean, maybe the machining is the way to go, but I'm sort of imagining sort of the future version. You've got some little arm, a little 3D printer, and it's just sort of forming, Yeah. you know, what is the robot? Like, what would the robot, if you sent a robot with a minimum setup, what, you know, mm. what would it be doing? To make it so tough. right now we're, we're kind of exploring that problem and actually i will graduate when i show that a system like that is possible uh, right so, so that okay. is the that is the goal nice um so what we're envisioning right now is is a robot arm a small three axis arm or hopefully three axis we'll see how bad it has to get um with an end effector and maybe a single um cutter yeah right and then it manipulates the ice, it machines away whatever shapes you need, um, and then it builds the next thing. And, and part of what I'm doing in my work, uh, and, and I mentioned this briefly in the paper um, for future work, is we're looking at designing joint modules that are self-contained with a motor, um, wireless interface, wireless, so distributed communication and power sources that you can then just drill into the ice naturally. So you have to bring the actuators with you. you we don't have the technology right. to make these things. But if we design these modules that have the actuators, 
in such a way that we can encase them in the ice easily without tools, um, that simplifies our job. And that's one of the goals we're going for. Right. Okay. So again, sort of imagine your, your dream version. This is mm -hmm. like, you've, you've gotten your, your PhD and it's been 10 years of development and oh. you've developed, you've designed, a. a a test platform that's been added to the Europa Clipper lander. Okay. Um, what do you think it will probably look like? I'm thinking we'll have a, a heterogeneous system. So you're going to have one thing that's going to be building all the different robots and another thing that is going to be exploring and um, driving around the space, collecting the material we need. So, something like a Mars rover looking thing would be driving around. And then your standard savvy oak arm might be out there moving things around and making these other robots. Can you give me some more specifics here? Because it sounds like, ah. <laughs> like, like I'm like, I'm like, I'm sort of imagining you've got a, a little rover that's rolling mm -hmm. around and gathering snow mm -hmm. into some collector. Sure. And, or, or, but I guess that would be going back to the molding idea. So, so is it more like carving off chunks oh, of ice and bringing them home to the, to the that's, manufacturing facility? That's kind of what we're thinking. Right. We're, we're thinking like you'd, you'd literally go out with a hot wire cutter or something like that. And kind of like they do, uh, or, or did back in the old days, they'd go out to the lake and they'd cut these giant blocks of ice. Right. And yeah. Move them. Yeah. Kind of like that is kind of what we're thinking. Right. And so you've got this, you've got one river that runs around and is cutting mm -hmm. out chunks of ice and then bringing them back to the, to the lander that right. has then got some kind of manufacturing facility on it, you know, some yeah. arm cutter, whatever. And it is able to then just take this raw material and carve out wheels and structural elements and exactly legs and whatever it is that you, that is then required. And then it is right. assembling the the it's bringing the whatever precious electronics it has and its actuators mm -hmm. and sensors and stuff like that and it's embedding them into this stuff as it's creating it yes okay all right i think it's, i think exactly. i can understand the, the plan so far so then let's talk a bit about like where you are today then and and okay. uh, we'll show some of the videos of of some of your robots doing their thing um but w like where are you in the in the progress right now okay so we have shown that IceBot is a thing you can build. Um, and, and that was the big step is, okay, guys, I'm going to do this for my dissertation. I promise it's going to work. Here, here's a paper that shows this is going to work, and now we just have to expand on it. So the next steps are going to be designing the joint module that I mentioned, making this really easy to incorporate, making it very energy efficient. And then the second step is let's make a robot arm. And let's show that this robot arm from ice can make another robot arm out of ice. And once I do that, we're done. Wow. So you want to actually make the robot arm out of ice, not just yeah. like that was, I was imagining you would have like a proper robot arm on your spacecraft and then it would, Oh no. you want to make the robot arm out of ice. Do we you want to eventually make it out of ice? Right. And I guess, I mean, just like straight up ice. I mean, I don't know. I mean, like when you're on Europa and it's, several hundred degrees below zero mm -hmm. ice gets hard it does does it get like hard enough to support the strength of a robot arm or would you need some kind of of additional material that you would put into it so that's one of the things we have to explore right. um and actually as potentially as part of my dissertation we'll be exploring how we can identify some of the material properties of ice as we build with it um, one of the big challenges of building with these in-situ materials, we don't know their material properties ahead of time. Like you walk on and you're like, well, that looks like it's strong enough to support my weight, but until you put your weight on it, you have no clue. Right. Um, so looking at different ways to, to get that information out um, is yeah. something we might also explore. I mean, I think about times when we've, we've found like, you know, I live in Canada and we have mm -hmm. our share of like icicles and things like that. And I think about the times when I've grabbed a gigantic icicle off the side of a house, you know, and it's, you know, it's yeah. got like a, you know, maybe it's two inches across and it's surprisingly strong. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's actually been a lot of, uh, a good amount of research on how the material properties of ice changes based on 
how it forms and the crystalline size and, and a bunch of other factors. Um, but you actually, you mentioned um, adding things into the ice to make it stronger, right? So, um, oh no, uh, Picrete. So back in World War II, okay, yeah, yeah. they actually explored um, using Picrete, which is mostly sawdust, right? And making an aircraft carrier out of this material. And I love reading about some of the rumors or like um, urban legends, I guess you could say, where like they would shoot the uh, the pikeite and it like deflects off and hits a general in the shoulder and things like that, just showing how strong that material actually is. Yeah, and so and so you could imagine some version of that, like maybe there's some kind of either a synthetic sawdust that you could make, or maybe there's something in the regolith that you could bring, or worst case scenario, you send some fiber along yeah. with the mission that it can then use to Im embed into the into the material that it's creating yeah exactly and actually there was a paper with um that that looked at the amount of dirt in ice and how that affected its strength and it significantly increased it so just dirt. definitely just dirt yeah yeah and so again if you're you know far if definitely you're on mars feasible. you've got probably cold temperatures and you've got um, material that you can have to work with. That's really interesting. Okay, so I want to show show people some of yeah. the robots that you've done so far. So I'm going to show the big the big Good one boy. here. This we're going to watch the whole presentation just so people can see. Um, so let's I'm just going to queue this up here. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and then I'm going to make it so you can see it, what we're seeing yeah. so you can talk about it. Okay, are um, you going to mute the audio? No, you won't be able to hear the audio. Okay, yeah. So, um, but you can see where we are at the, gotcha. but I'm assuming you know the video. So let's, uh, I, I did record the audio, uh, a few months ago, so it might be a little, it, I might remember work. some of it. Okay. Well, we're just going to have to live with it. Presents Icebot <laughs> and an analysis of the manufacturing techniques used to build the robot for energy cost and effectiveness. Yes. We follow three design Icebot, principles. We talk about our design principles. Through an um, example, we investigate various techniques to shape obvious, ice to fit the functional requirements of the robot and methods of integrating uh, actuators into those blocks of ice. Oops, just wait till, wait till we get to the end of Four your video. methods of integrating actuators with blocks of ice are presented. While heat-based methods are able to create a space for the actuator, the part was often deformed by water runoff in the process. Although similar in effectiveness and energy costs to the heated rod method, cutting was most reliable at creating space without affecting the remainder of the part. Once there was sufficient space for the actuator, it could be positioned and frozen in place. The robot was able to climb icy inclines of up to 2.5 degrees and clear lightweight obstacles from its path in testing. In warmer environments, additional weight is added over the wheelbase to overcome the layer of water that forms between the wheel and the floor, giving the robot more traction. All right, that was awesome. Uh, okay, I'll bring, uh, bring us back to you. Um, that's not gonna help. Okay. 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 Great. So let's so explain then what we saw there. We saw a, um, we saw you you tested out a bunch of different ideas for mm -hmm. building for building your robot. Right. Um, and so you tried you tried melting, you tried cutting, and you tried uh, forming. Yeah. So there were there were three. Um, so you had to form the ice blank, right? So to do that, we just said we're going to mold it. It's going to be easiest but we discussed potentially 3D printing it or machining it. Um, and one of the things, one of the conclusions we came to is machining is really efficient, but only if you don't have to remove a lot of extraneous material, otherwise 3D printing might be your better option, just right. in terms of how much is in the part versus how much you have to take off. Right, right. Um, and then the next step was, okay, how do we make spots for the actuators? So we tried melting things. That was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and then we tried cutting things, uh, which had its own challenges. Um, um, okay, so um, the and so let's talk about the actual robot. So how much yeah. of that robot was ice and how much of that robot was parts? The only so the main body of the robot was ice um, in its entirety. Except the wheels. For... I mean, we like for the people who are like listening to this in oh, podcast yes. form. It okay. it had a it had an ice body. It had a it had like a plow in the front that it was using to move yeah. stuff out of the way from it. It had wheels, and the wheels were made of ice. Mm -hmm. And then it had this this electronics 
portion that yeah. was built on top of it. So like maybe like weight ratio, how much of the by weight Oof. was electronics and how much was ice? I mean, it's a little misleading because water is so heavy, right? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> or or density. I mean, whatever. Yeah, like, it looks so, like it was maybe a tenth of it was electronics and 90% was ice, maybe 70. Yeah, I, I would say 80 to 90% of it is yeah. ice. Like I needed spots for the batteries, the main circuit board. Right. The motors just went straight into the ice and that yeah. was pretty much it. And, and again, in the video, we watched it climb up a ramp. We watched it push <laughs> objects out of the way. Um, and so this was a, was like a three wheeled contraption. How, how complicated have you built these robots now? So we, we started off very simple. So two wheeled robot with a, a ping pong ball as a caster wheel. Mm -hmm. Um, so the not three wheels, of, two wheels and a caster. two wheels yeah, and okay. a caster. And just in the spirit of making things easy. Yep. Um, and that actually is as complicated as we've gotten so far. Um, Mostly because uh, of, of COVID, I would I would say actually, I uh, I got uh, the lab shut down. So my lab is now in my apartment. I've right. got my little chest freezer against the wall. <laughs> right, you're that's... dropping blocks of ice in your chest freezer in your house. Yeah. Yeah. So haven't haven't been able to make things much bigger. We've actually been focusing more on the joint modules recently. Right. Right. Um, okay. So so I think I think that sets a pretty good baseline for where we kind of stand with your mm -hmm. with your research work so far. So now I want to sort of follow your your imagination. So, okay. you know, we talked a little bit about like what the actuators and robots and stuff. So what do you think kind of theoretically is the limit of this technology? Where do you think from an ice standpoint, where do you think it would work and, and where do you think it would be effective? Okay, so I would say that ice would be effective in any sub-zero environment. But again, depends on the mission that we're trying to do. Um, one of the things we noticed with the ice wheels was that it's actually pretty difficult to climb up ramps made of ice. Uh, I, I think I could climb like a one and a half degree ramp without me coming in to like push the thing up the ramp. To, to climb a ramp made of ice with a robot made of ice? Yeah. Right. So um, in, in that sense, it, it gets a little challenging, but if you start incorporating maybe regolith or other sorts of things, you can increase your traction and then climb. Um, and in terms of missions, I don't think you're gonna see these things lifting 10 tons of spaceship and moving them all around, but maybe we, because there, there have been um, studies looking at printing printing um, shelters on Mars out of regolith, right? So maybe instead of using the regolith, you use the ice. Mm -hmm. Like it's already there. You don't have to mix anything. It's just good to go. Yeah. Gives you radiation um, protection. Yeah. Yep. And, and you could then have your little um, ice Mars rovers driving around and collecting all the data you need. Um, really, I'm kind of picturing, I really want to say a colony. I've been reading way too much science fiction lately. Um, so like almost the colony just kind of on Mars or in another cold planet where these robots are able to operate, repair themselves, make more of themselves as needed, drive around just doing whatever they need to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that um, kind of? Answer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's from a cold environment. So then, you know, let's move into some realms that you that you haven't okay. you've imagined, but you haven't actually done any practical work on mm -hmm. it. You've imagined the the tree option, but of course, that doesn't get you very far on Mars or the moon right. or, or uh, Europa. So mm -hmm. let's talk about regolith. What okay. do you, what are your thoughts on, on adapting this idea of towards regolith stone or, or, and then maybe even types of metal that could be extracted I, locally? I think adapting the idea to different materials has a lot of potential. Um, one of the nice things about ice is it, fuses together. You don't need glue or any of that uh, extra adhesive, right? Whereas with regular, I'm not actually familiar with how they make the material that they 3D print with, but I assume there needs to be some add additive. Yeah, in. I think there's like a, a magnesium, they add like a kind of magnesium, oh, I forget the name of the substance, but they, they turn, there's actually a paper that just came out 
yesterday that we were covering, but you you essentially slurp in a bunch of regolith, you mm -hmm. mix it with some additive to turn it into a paste, okay. and then you 3D print out that paste into various structures. And the, the resolution is pretty good. Like you can make yeah. pretty intricate little objects and that's sort of at the one end. And then at the sort of the larger scale end, there are you know, people are making really interesting kinds of concrete out of regolith, like, mm -hmm. like large quantities of, of, of concrete that you could make a building, a house, whatever out of. Right. And then the, the other thing that's being tested out quite well is this idea of sintering. Okay. And, and, and so you can take metals from, and you can, you can, instead of welding, you can use this technology called sintering mm -hmm. and you can actually form structures. And, and I think you're exactly right that, that up until this point, um, you know, a lot of the focus has been on, on assembly in space. Like right now, mm -hmm. everything, like when you think about something like the C. James Webb, it just gets launched from earth, unfolds in space, we hope, and you've got a space telescope. The next generation, I mean, James Webb will be the last telescope that is launched and, and assembled. It mm -hmm. was launched and then unfurled in one big launch. From this point on, it's all going to be assembly, like the International Space Station. Yep. But then the hope is following in the footsteps of that is going to be on orbit assembly that you just send yeah. buckets of goo and plastic pellets and and mirror chunks and then the, the telescope starts to assemble its trusses and and center its mirrors and all that kind of stuff right spray paint its solar panels onto whatever flat structure is available mm -hmm. and and so on and so forth so but i've never heard anybody approach this pro the structural problem like the way you've approached it with the ice which is why i wanted to get you um yeah. you know having a conversation with you gotcha um so then like of the you know beyond ice where would you like to look next well so my immediate answer beyond ice would be i want to go back to wood but that's really just well that's that's because of my, my background is um, I started out as like a maintenance guy at, at a Harvard research forest. And then they were like, hey, we need a robot built. Can you do it? So then I built my first robot in a forest. Um, and, and we were looking at forests. And then I was fortunate enough to get accepted to Mark Gim's lab. And we started making robots from ice. So like just kind of going back to my roots. Oh, and I'm making terrible puns. Um, <laughs> right. Going back to, to kind of the base of where I started and maybe looking a bit more at tree branches um, is, is one such thing that I'd be really interested in looking at um, a lot because it gives you, you can start getting interesting, um, interesting material properties because their tree branches themselves are going to be stronger in one direction than the other. Right. So you can start choosing how to design your structures to just the um, the intricacy of your structures is is very different. It's not so much an isotropic material as now it's more anisotropic and the, the design is completely different. Uh, sorry, when you say anisotropic, what do you mean by that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so if I have a cube and I push one direction into it, it will behave differently than if I push another direction into it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but I mean, obviously, you know, we're, I can't stress this enough. There are no trees on the moon. Right. Like so, I, you know, so, but so then, so then having, what kind of applications you see here on earth with your wooden robots? Yeah. Um, well, ecology would be one thing. Um, if you could get these robots to move through the forest and, and maybe do some of the data collection that ecologists um, already do, uh, for example, uh, like, and they're actually doing a lot of this with quad rotors now, but having something with boots on the ground, so to speak, could be a really interesting application. Um, one of the projects uh, they were doing in this forest was every day research assistants would go out and they'd have to measure the diameter of different trees in the mm -hmm. forest and, and record that. But maybe somehow in the future, a robot could do that. And these research assistants could be more focused on analyzing the data that they're collecting. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, when you're here on Earth, the, I mean, 
swapping out parts on a robot is relatively easy because you've got oxygen mm -hmm. and temperature and you can just walk around and just, you know, gravity and you just take the robot and, and slap on a new part and, and away you go. Um, I mean, it, it really feels like the application is space. I mean, I don't, so, I don't mean to, I don't no, mean no, no, to, to, to drive the direction of your entire career, I, but, but I you're, totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then, so let's go all the way to von Neumann. Um, okay. which is like, what do you, what in your imagination does a self replicating robot probe look like? Ooh. So that's a great question. Um, and the challenge is there are so many good papers out there with these ideas of probes. It's like, how do I separate my imagination from theirs? Right. So nope, just wherever you want to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the 80s, there was a lot of focus on self-replicating factories. Um, and one of a really cool paper was they were going to put um, a rail gun and launch materials to the moon and then or from the moon and then use that to like build their self-replicating factory on the moon. Most recently, actually, there was a paper that got put out um, where they described a really long rectangular robot with an arm that would land on asteroids and replicate itself using um, the materials it finds. Um, in, in terms of true self-replicating robots for exploration, I would lean some, towards more some, something more like that, something that looks more like a satellite that's able to fly around, land on different asteroids, collect the materials it needs, and then make an exact replica and send it off. Mm -hmm. For exploration, I would imagine more of a factory-like setting. Mm -hmm. um, so, or for planetary exploration, I should say, I would imagine more of a factory-like setting. Right. I mean, the thing that's kind of interesting is like NASA is testing out, uh, shortly actually going to be testing out a new kind of CubeSat using water as a propellant. So it's going to. Ooh, I haven't seen that. Yeah, they're going to put a they're going to put a pint of water into the spacecraft, and then while it's in orbit, it's CubeSat, it's going to separate the water into hydrogen and oxygen, and then recombine them as a tiny little LOX, um, you know, rocket. Okay as opposed to steam, which has been tested out and as opposed right. to just like throwing the mass overboard as a propellant, they're actually going to turn it into liquid or mm -hmm. liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen as a or gas hydrogen, gas oxygen, they're going to make just enough as they go to then right. turn that into fuel and use that as a way to rock it. And so the thing is kind of interesting is I sort of think about your robot with its made of ice, mm -hmm. but ice is also fuel. And mm. so it could theoretically be sort of forming, it could, it could, I guess, use its own yeah. self as propellant as well. That's a really cool idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then Ooh. let's go back. So, so then, so you've got the idea, you've got like exploration spacecraft that are looking more like a traditional, mm -hmm. like a traditional robot that we would build here on Earth. And then... Right on the planet, you've got some kind of factory that is actually um, like building robots. So again, like, okay, so let me let me sort of s explain what I think is the is the disconnect okay. here is that you are afraid to really let your science fiction imagination run wild here. And uh, <laughs> this is a safe space. Uh, you can tell I'm I'm completely ready to uh, to follow this flight of fancy with you and 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 wow. what like, because I don't think it's going to look like a robot. I don't think it's going to look like right. a like because again, you've got you've got all this 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 rough material that you can use to get the job done at a sort of basic okay. fundamental level. All right, so so let's get really crazy here, right? Yeah, yeah. We're going to on Mars. Let's get crazy. <laughs> Reading way too much science fiction. Yeah, not enough. Death, Death Worlder series is amazing. Oh, thanks. I've been okay. On that. Yeah, I'll, I'll get a list of recommendations from you after um, this. But no, 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 no. Okay. please. Yeah. Do so, not hold back. All right, fine. We got we got a blob of ice. Yeah. Let's plop it on some ice. Yeah. Some more ice. So ice on ice. Yeah. And then somehow we can melt the front of this thing, and it'll pull itself forward by like freezing and refreezing as it goes. So your ice blob on a sheet of ice. Yep. Yeah. Front of ice blob melts. Yep. 
and then refreezes and somehow pulls itself forward in that manner. So that's potentially Locomotion. one idea. Locomotion of sorts. Right. Um, Is that energy efficient? No clue. Okay. All right. I'm just, you know, it's Yeah, yeah no, no, fine. You, no, you I, 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 did, I did. I did. I did. Place. I did say to get crazy. So, yeah. No, I, um, I, I rescind my <laughs> skepticism. <laughs> so it's something like that, right? Yeah. Where now you're no longer dependent on ice wheels. You can move over all this space pretty easily, I yeah. imagine. Um, and because you're melting and refreezing, the limitation of what you're able to carry with you is limited to that joint. But ice is pretty strong, especially when you melt and refreeze it, as, as you demonstrated with your um, icicle yeah. up in Canada, right? Like, So now you're able to carry these massive blocks of ice back. Now we can actually build these massive structures. Um, I, I would say a skyscraper is a really bad idea, but you know, maybe if we wanted to try it, we could. Yeah. Um, but things like that. And then now it's no longer, um, I guess it's no longer traditionally a robot in your sense. It's no longer has these wheels. It's somehow melting the line in front of it and pulling itself forward. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of how else I can make this crazier. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the, uh, the issue is like, you know, when you think about the Fermi paradox and we think about the fact mm -hmm. that we're alone, that we, you know, that we, we don't have any, the universe is big and old and, and, and wherever the aliens, wherever the civilizations showed up, they should have been able to, to send ice, robot ice factories, self-replicating robot ice factories to every star system in the Milky Way. And so mm -hmm. why, you know, and so then we wonder why don't we see these robotic ice factories pumping out ice bots everywhere yeah. in the in the solar system. Um, this, this thinking this line of thinking makes it even makes the Fermi paradox even more troubling because it feels <laughs> like, like when we think about a self replicating robot, we're kind of imagining something that is, you know, you've got like those dancing robots from, uh, oh, I forget the name of the company, you know, that was the just Boss Dynamics. Yeah, Boss Dynamics. Yeah, they're dancing robots. So you imagine that, like, yeah. make a robot, make a copy of that, but make a robot, make a copy of a thing that looks like a blob of ice. So, so what do you think? Oh, of, I see. I see. What I mean, so like, what is the minimum? What is the bare minimum to, to jumpstart? What is the seed? of the future self-replicating robot factory. If a seed is a tree, what is the seed of the robot mm. of the ice robot factory? I think the seed would be an arm. An arm with an end effector. And all you need to do just just a robot arm. Yep. With an end effector on it. Yeah. Because all you need to do is pick up the ice that you have locally. Yep. Machine it into something and then you're done. Because that thing that you've made can go out and collect more material, bring it back. Okay, hold on. Let's, that's awesome. Okay, let me think this through. Okay, so you've just got, you send a robot arm mm -hmm. with some kind of power source or like yeah, solar panels source. on it or whatever. And it doesn't have to be very big because it can build itself a better robot arm later. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's you like. You basically just need something to get that starting block yeah. of material that you can build with. Yeah. And so you, it's like a tiny little robot arm that is able to build itself a tiny little body. Mm -hmm. And then it can start to move itself around and acquire larger and larger quantities of resource, right? To, to form larger structures, wheels, yeah, uh, assembly lines, etc. The challenge is some of the more complex things like the electronics, etc. Right. What do you think about that? So that's one of the reasons we're looking at distributed control using our modular joints, because now you no longer have to wire. You, you don't have to worry about wire connections. You just drill into the ice and you're done. Um, the, the trick being, if we want a true self-replicating system, you need to mine that material, um, which is something we haven't necessarily considered, mostly because other papers have looked at it and said, okay, there exist these elements on these other, yeah. on these asteroids, et cetera, and we can get them. And if we can get them, then we can build these things and we're good to go. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, like, design. like, everything you need to build a chip fab mm -hmm. is is located on the moon or on Mars or in an asteroid or whatever, in the same way that everything that's needed to make a human being is 
comp- composed, composed, you know, you could go into yeah. a into a chemical factory and grab a bunch of nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen and dump it on the mm-hmm. floor and go, you know, there's your human. <laughs> So, yeah, pretty much. So what do you think is the most complicated thing that is part of the seed, mm. but is, but, but you would need to try to manufacture out of, out of local resources? We're talking like 50 years in the future, right? Well, yeah. 50 whole years in the future. Yeah. Maybe, maybe even more. Maybe a hundred. Um, I'll give you a hundred years yeah. in the future. Like, like what Definitely do you think the is chips. The, it's chips? I think so. Yeah. I mean, if we have... You have solar panels already, right? You just send a couple of those. There's your power source. Well, and and in fact, you, you know, if you if you browse the backlog of videos here, there's a bunch of researchers that are that are that have developed a way to do low cost sintering with solar panels, where they just have a robot that runs along the lunar surface. It gobbles up lunar regolith and poops it out the back as solar panels. That's so cool. Yeah. All right, yeah. I'm going to have to browse these videos later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so in other words, your solar panel problem has been solved. The other thing is there's this stuff called, um, oh, there's a there's another kind of solar panel. There's the P, and I'm forgetting the name. But you can essentially spray paint it. And it doesn't work mm-hmm. well here on Earth because mm-hmm. it, it reacts with oxygen. But in space, there's mm-hmm. no oxygen, so it works really well. Wow. And so, again, okay. you could just take this. You could take, like, a liter of it and spray paint a solar panel on a gigantic amount of space. So power generation is probably not, not a problem. An issue, but microcontrollers, making the chips to control yeah. the robot is the problem. Um, and it's one of the things no one has touched in the literature. They're all like, yep, we can totally do this. If we get the right materials, we're good to go. It's fine. Um, could you go sim- Could you simplify? Perovskite, there you go. T. Home is saying in the, in the chat. Oh, so perovskite okay, is, the, is the stuff. So could you simplify? Could you like... You know, people have talked about this idea of like a clockwork rover on mm-hmm. Venus. So instead of sending sensitive Bernie electronics to Venus, you send a, a rover that's built of clockwork materials. You know, how yeah. far could you get? How, how intelligent could you get out of ice? It's a great question. Like you're, you're talking like the automatons from like the dark ages, right? They're, because those exist too. Sure. I, mean, I don't know if they're, an they're, automaton is going to build a. That's probably a poor description of it, but. But I know what you mean. Yeah, like a whole yeah. clockwork, a whole clockwork machine that can do hmm. that. You might be able to do something like that with ice. I mean, ice. It, it's if it's small features are very brittle, so you might need to scale up everything. Right. But if you scaled it properly, you probably could get away with that. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I wonder. Like, I wonder what huh. the. I mean, again, I mean, it's sort of like going back to first principles, right? When you think about like, what is a chip? It's mm-hmm. really just it is really just performing logic. It's performing right. operations. And I've heard it described that a tree is actually the most intelligent creature on Earth. The oldest, biggest tree is the most intelligent creature on Earth. Really? Because it's because it it's performing operations very slowly, but it's okay. performing them for a very long period of time. I see. And so, and so you may, um, or may wise is a better way to describe it. But, yeah. but the, but, but when you think about, uh, you know, an organism, if, mm-hmm. if you're not concerned about, t- you know, our time, if you're not concerned about our human time, right. I wonder, and instead you're just like, what can you do with the local resources? Simplify, simplify, simplify. I wonder what you could get done. I bet you could totally make something like that. If you could figure out how to deal with the axle problem, where like making an axle out of ice that's spinning. So the fatigue on ice could be a problem eventually, right? But if you could figure out that problem, I believe you could make it. That'd yeah. be really cool. Yeah. Oh. There's like have you ever seen um like you like people on Minecraft, there's this stuff on Minecraft called Redstone, which which acts like computer controls. And so people make these really mm-hmm. complicated things in Minecraft where all they're using is just essentially AND gates and NAND gates okay. and, you know, very simple, simple things that make very complicated. People have made uh, computer displays and oh. um, uh, arithmetic chips and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, and so like I wonder, but, he, you know, and so like we're so here on earth, we're so process processor rich yeah. that we can like send a learning algorithm to go and identify cats 
mm-hmm. which is, you That's know, fine. and then, and then burn through tons of fossil fuels to do so. But I wonder, can you simplify, 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 like what is the, again, so like, what's the minimum? what is the minimum amount of processing required from a, I guess, from a technology standpoint to run that arm, to perform those operations? I mean, it depends on what you're building, but like, if you're just cutting a block of ice down to a smaller block of ice, you're like, okay, I'm going to program this thing to move up three feet and then yeah. over six. Like, that's not that hard, I don't think. If it if it's not trying to make decisions on its own, if time is has if you can send yeah. instructions. Oh, I see. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think you're exactly right, though. Like, it doesn't have to necessarily know what to do. You just say, go up, go to the right, go down, pull the piece out, perform mm-hmm. the operation, and then you come back a week later and you're like, yep, there's our block did it 3d printer just simplified right because again the yeah. the challenge you know the the sending a complicated chip to another planet or having mm. to try to build a complicated chip is one thing having a having a simple um, so imagine like you've got the mother brain that you send yeah. and then it produces really dumb um, almost mechanical versions or what from whatever is local. Yeah. You know. I'm just, I'm thinking back to like what they teach us in mechatronics and you always start with like, you always replace your integrated circuits with just your straight up analog stuff. And then yeah. you're like, Oh, there's an analog circuit that exists. That's so much easier. I'm going to use this. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. And so I wonder yeah. what are the, you know, again, if you, if all you've got is regolith and you've, you're taking, actually never you've got that. regolith and you're just, um, because there's some great technology to turn regolith into various metals. Like people have just been able to yeah. separate the metals out of regolith really nicely. You've just got okay. little piles of aluminum when you're done with it, right? Yeah. No, I I love where you're headed. We've we've actually never really approached it from the can we even replace the electronics? We just assumed it was too complicated. But I guess that's what I get for not playing Minecraft with my brother. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you see what people are doing in in redstone it'll blow your mind what is right, shane possible. i know you're watching you have to show me this after yeah okay all right um and then and so then then the question is could you start to simplify the actual and again i mean ice maybe ice makes a great way of separating the wires yeah like hmm. yeah i guess if you can just show that um that ice won't break under the loads but if it's just a logic system it shouldn't be under too much load then it it should be fine yeah it'd be heat though which would be a problem yeah but like i think somebody pointed out a little earlier they're like oh well it's gonna be like negative 200 wherever you are so it's probably fine yeah yeah totally so you know yeah Um, i'm just i'm trying to think of how you do the wires now like or does it have to be all gear based well maybe you could do wires i mean like again if you if you i mean we're so used to transistors but you know could Mm. you could you take you know, grab, suck in uh, aluminum or iron and then turn that into wires. You know, you could make wires, no problem. But yeah. but can you make intelligent chips? It's back to the chips, right? Back to the chips, yeah. always back to the chips. Yeah. But maybe you do huh. just send a couple of chips in an arm and then it's got a it's got a stack of chips and every robot gets a chip. And eventually it's like, I'm all out of chips. Send more chips. I mean, that, that kind of was the original plan, um, at least for this thesis, would be we're going to show the first partially self-replicating robot yeah. because it can replicate its body yeah. by itself. Um, um, so I, I used to work with the XPRIZE uh, a couple of years ago, and okay. and so we were doing challenges on this platform called, called HeroX. And mm-hmm. so one of the challenges that I put together, I never really finish it off, but I now I'm feeling inspired to kind of go back and, and take a better crack at it, which was to do a self-replicating robot challenge. So every year Ooh. people try to come together and make a robot, make as much robot as it can of itself. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that, uh, cause I, th- I don't think it's that far. Like, so, so timeline, when do you think we see, have a robot build a copy of itself that can go off and do more work? I mean, I'm personally hoping by May of 2022, I'd, I'd like to <laughs> yeah. graduate sometime soon. <laughs> yeah, May of 2022, you get, boom, ice robot, you get to, you get your doctorate. Um, that's, that's what I promised them. We'll see if it happens. When, but when does humanity have robots ah. out in space that are building more copies of themselves to then explore the solar system? When do you think that's feasible? 
I think it will become feasible as soon as we convince some somebody like a NASA that this isn't a crazy theoretical idea and that it actually has applications. And the people at, um, oh, um, I'm blanking. Um, and, and I've spoken with people who like, who are in the space industry and they're like, oh, that's a really cool idea, but it's not yet at the practical application because we don't yeah, know well, about these things. Here's the tip. They, they will never, they will <laughs> never be ready. Like, like okay. it took like 30 years from when ion engines were developed to when they were mm -hmm. implemented in a spacecraft really? on deep sp on deep space one and okay. and it required a sort of a herculean collection of mm. of weird projects so you look at the deep space one spacecraft it was the first one to have a star tracker it had its own ion engine there was a bunch of this random technologies built mm -hmm. on board that had never been tested out autonomy Right. Oh. And because nobody ever wants to take that risk and try right. new technology. Costs a lot of money to ship it. Yeah. And then and then on the on the other hand, look at something like say James Webb, where they they added five or six brand new technologies that had never been tested out. And mm -hmm. it has gone over budget, to say the least. <laughs> and has has caused uh certain people to be under fire. And oh. so you have to have that balance of being able to demonstrate these technologies at the same time that you you're not destroying people's careers. That's fair. So, so I can see why it's going to be an uphill struggle to, to it, do that. Very much so. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, I think you're right though. If we can show that like, you don't even need chips, then it's give me a chip and I can give you the world, but like, yeah. I don't even need a chip. Yeah. Yeah. Chip in an arm and I'll move the world. That'd be so cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I want to bring in some questions here. So, yeah, um, uh, Corey S asks, could you make circuits using distilled water as an insulator and salt water as the wires? That's a great question. That's a great and question. What a great the idea. Tr the trick is, how do you keep them separate? Yes. Right? Like, you almost have to make your feature with slots for the salt water to be in and then put the salt water in in place yeah. after the fact but would it theoretically conduct electricity along the salt water i mean it should salt water does conduct electricity and distilled water is theoretically a perfect insulator yeah that's a great question wow okay arjon that's asks uh, is there anything out now that could be helped with ice parts or ice replacement parts mm. Well, I mean, if your ice hotel starts to crack, you, you might need to replace something like that. Uh, in terms of anything robotic wise that needs to, that could, that could use this. Um, I mean, I would argue that any rover operating in a cold environment could potentially benefit from these ice replacement parts if it means augmentation in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, send a robot, I mean, in Antarctica, send your robot rover, robot rope, your ice robot <laughs> out to the ice structure to repair yeah. any, any, you know, after the, the summer melt. And then, um, so I, you can imagine some applications here on earth, but I would love to see some ice robot just on the, you know, exploring the wastes of, you know, the open spaces of Antarctica. It would be interesting. That'd be the perfect I, test paste, right? I have so many dreams of that. <laughs> do you think there's any limit? Like, do you think there's any reason why you couldn't do that today? Um, like, like, I guess I'm just saying like temperature wise, like, like the temperature, temperature in wise, no. is always freezing it for large chunks of Antarctica, right? Right. Actually, in my paper, the, um, I, I use McMurdo as, as our base of operations, uh, where it's always like negative 12 or negative 17 Fahrenheit, I think. Right. So right. like it's always well below. Um, and McMurdo, yeah. Yeah, McMurdo. Uh, so temperature-wise, no. Um, in terms of where the technology currently is, yes. Uh, I, I don't think we're there yet. Yep. Um, we're getting there. But uh, Arjun also asked, um, what kind of movements would Nice Robot be capable of? We've seen rolling. Right. We so talked about rolling. we talked about you know melting and and so on, but right. Uh, um, so other things we're exploring, um, I mean, melting is, is one of them and using that melting to, to move. 
uh, I've pitched creating a quad rotor from ice to one of the guys who does quad rotors in mod lab. Um, he a thought that could be cool if we could show it's light enough. A quad rotor? Mm hmm Like a flying Like ice? a flying thing. But the propellers are made of ice? Even, and the body. We, we agree that force-wise, structurally, it might not work, but it'd be cool to try. But, <laughs> but here, yes. But maybe a place like Titan, where the atmosphere is, is twice as thick, the gravity is 15% yeah. is or whatever. Like, and if you reinforce it with sawdust or dirt, then, yeah, you might be able to get away with it. Yeah, that's really interesting. That might be the perfect – Titan would be perfect because it's – on Titan, the, the entire terrain is ice. And yet mm -hmm. the, and then the seas are made of, of, of methane. Right. And so the mountains and stuff are, are ice that's as hard as rock in mine, you know, again, ridiculously cold temperatures. So cool. So I think Titan is your spot. Like if there's one place <laughs> you need to go, a submarine Definitely on Titan. Viable. Made Definitely of ice. viable. Well, wasn't there, there was just a NASA robot that came out that like went underneath the ice and like roll yes. along the under so like yeah something like that just out of ice and you're done mm -hmm. yeah and it it's going to try to float so it's gonna it's gonna try to mm -hmm. go up against the ice and roll around yeah you don't need any extra ballast you're good yeah yeah i think you've solved that that's <laughs> perfect <laughs> i love it awesome all right well so we've reached the end of our hour uh yeah no where does the time go um but if people want to follow what you're doing want to uh watch your progress or maybe even contribute mm -hmm. other ideas where should they go all right so i, I have a, a we'll call it a youtube channel it's got like three videos yeah and i put a link to your video in the show notes and i'll and so yeah, people so can, can check that out definitely there um i'm on the mob Lab website which you've also linked um and then if you just find me on linkedin like that, that works too. Or you can email me, um, uh, C D E V I N at C's dot U N dot E D U. Okay. Awesome. And, and that's on your mod lab. Down there. Yeah. yeah, actually. Yeah. It's on my mod lab. Then. Yep. We're good. Yep. So uh, yeah, that all sounds, that all sounds great. And please, you know, like it was, uh, you know, part of the reason why I've got you here is the, the story was really well received on universe today. Yeah, um, we really enjoyed covering it and thinking about it. And we were sort of talking about it behind the scenes. A lot of the writers were, were pretty excited about the idea. And, you know, just talking to you personally, I think it's been great. And I really appreciate it. And um, please keep us posted on any of new course. developments. And, uh, and if I think of other weird, random, um, you know, side technologies that I noticed that I think could be relevant, oh. I'll, I'll definitely let you know. Please, yeah. please do. <laughs> yeah. The, um, there's, there's some, there's some great people that are working on, yeah, again, look at some of the, um, the previous stuff that I've, that I've done. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can definitely connect you to some people who are thinking about this problem in other stuff like mm -hmm. regolith centering, for sure. things like I that. Would, That'd be great. I'm definitely going to reach Wonderful. out. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for watching us today. Thank you to Thanks all of the moderators who were acting behind the scenes. I really appreciate it. And, uh, We've got uh, Astronomy Cast starts in an hour, so you can watch that. And then, of course, we're going to have another virtual star party on the weekend and then open space again on Monday. So lots of busy uh, stuff for you to watch coming up. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, this was a nice episode. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.